the big Charleston contest. I am uh, Stefano. I am an Italian man. You've reached the house of unrecognized talent. Who cares about me? Not me, that's for sure. I think it proves you're all daft. I suppose we're getting into trouble for saying that now. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. We're all pretty bizarre. But some of us are just better at hiding, but that's all. Well, New York City can dig it, because we're number one! Well, everybody's continually searching for love, and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Well, nobody likes me here, as usual. Who among you doesn't have an insecurity? Who among you doesn't depend on someone or something to help you get through the day? Domo arigato, Mr. Scotto. You never get it right, do you? You're either crawling all over them, licking their boots, or spitting poison at them like some benzodrine puff adder. Just trying to enjoy myself. Well, Oakley Duck, thanks for joining me out here in the cool of the evening here in North Carolina. Actually, you know, as hot as it's been in North Carolina, uh, for a few days this week, it was actually several degrees below normal for the high. I mean, not that you notice a difference. I mean, the normal high would be 91 and it was 87 or something like that, or 91 and it was 89. So we've actually been a couple degrees <laughs> below normal. Um, you know, of course, next week we'll be a couple degrees oh, above normal. That's the way it works. That's how you get averages, that kind of thing. So anywho, I promise we talk about with my lovely chorus in the background here, the boogs. Um, we're going to talk about pizza. And we're going to talk briefly about pizza today. And also tomato pies. And if you don't know what a tomato pie is, you need to find out what a tomato pie is. <laughs> but I did go back because something was interesting. And I'll probably, on the blog, I'll lay this out in more detail. And I'll go into the Greek, etc. And even a little bit of the Hebrew. Um, but I was thinking about when I was talking about... Oh, first of all. Let me complain about my university. Uh, UNCG. UNCG has 800 trillion 75 billion uh, benches. They don't have a whole lot of tables, though. <laughs> an awful lot of benches. You know, every time they upgrade the campus, they put these lovely, lovely benches they put everywhere. Whole rows of benches sometimes, <laughs> but not a lot of tables. I got some tables at the fountain, but it's too loud there because of the fountain for me to use. So I go around campus trying to look for tables to use at lunch. You know, I'm, I'm limited on time anyway. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I kind of scope out the campus as I'm walking across in the course of my day. And I see, I see benches, 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 benches. <laughs> I need to get my own little portable table to take around with me. Um, so anyway, because today it was really, it was a beautiful day on campus. Uh, today my daughter was in her white coat ceremony in med school. That was very exciting. My daughter, London. Uh, so, you know, she sent us pictures and videos of that ceremony. She's out in Denver. Um... And Rocky Mountain Vista Medical School out there, and um, anyway, so uh, but again, it was it was a beautiful day on campus. And when I I, I went out, uh, I had to go walking across campus this morning, kind of scoping out. I said, "Gosh, this place has so many benches and no tables." So anywho, that's my problem. <laughs> but I was um, thinking about a few things. I was thinking about when I talked about synagogues. You know, it was interesting that. In the King James and the Greek, because the New Testament, as we call it, is written in Greek. Now, one of the things that's interesting is Greek is, is, is like English. It's written from left to right. And Hebrew is written and read right to left. So it's interesting as you sit there with your Bible, theoretically, your Hebrew is all going this way and the Greek is all going this way. Anywho, uh, be that as it may, though I mentioned the word synagogue. And the synagogue in the Greek however many times I said it was mentioned, used in the Greek in the New Testament. It's, it's translated synagogue or synagogues every time except for once, which is in uh, James, where it's translated, if a man enter your synagogue, they change it there to assembly or some other word in English, depending on your translation. Well, I was curious, uh, you know, synagogues were sort of, the local little smaller synagogue was sort of an outgrowth uh, on, a, on a massive scale of the dispersion when, when the Jews were sent into captivity and they could no longer go to the temple, they couldn't keep the feasts and that sort of thing. Uh, so they, they met in these, these smaller congregations. And of course, the Lord goes in Luke 4 to the synagogue in Nazareth where he reads from Isaiah and then he rightly divides it by splitting the verse. And we talked about that uh, in a fairly recent podcast, I think toward the end of season two. 
Anyway, there's a thing called the Septuagint. The Septuagint was during that captivity when Greek, uh, the Greek Empire particularly, dominated the world scene and the Middle East in particular, but that, that whole part of the world, uh, really from, uh, from that area of Europe, southeastern Europe, all the way through the Middle East over to India, as a matter of fact. So anywho, um, down into Egypt and, uh, and North, North Africa. So Greek became the predominant culture and the predominant language, and this is where you get a lot of things that Paul has to deal with, with Greek, Greek cultures and false gods and that sort of thing coming into, uh, adopted into Judaism proper. Anyway, so while they were there, there was a translation done of the Hebrew texts into Greek, and that is called the Septuagint. Now, there are some bodies within Christendom that use the Septuagint over the Hebrew, and you can guess who those might be, Greek, etc. <laughs> that territory, eastern territory of Europe in Greece, where they speak Greek. Uh, anyway, be that as it may. So I said, well, I wonder if synagogues used in the Septuagint, since it is Greek. Now, Septuagint also includes the, the Apocrypha. So if you have a Bible, if you have a Catholic Bible or Orthodox Bible, there's a section there that's the Apocrypha. You can go look up the word Apocrypha. I don't want to talk about the Apocrypha right now. I've done, I think I've talked about the Apocrypha in the first two, one of the first episodes of the first two seasons in, in discussing the Bible. But anyway, the Apocrypha exists in the Greek. And I'm not saying that the Apocrypha is not valuable. Of course it's valuable. A lot of extra-biblical writings are valuable. Uh, they're very valuable for cultural reasons. The Septuagint is valuable because it gives us word usage sometimes for the New Testament. Since it's written in that 400-year period, roughly, um, between the, the closing of the Hebrew canon and then the appearance of the Lord uh, in around 4 B.C. Anyway, as you know how we reckon time, but right around 4 B.C., right around year zero, let's put it that way. Um, so you have that intertestamental period is what it's called. And th these books are written then. There's some historical things. There's some crazy things in there. There's a number of these books, and it depends on what group you're in as to which ones they consider canonical and which ones they don't, meaning canon, part of the biblical canon. Uh, but again, it varies from somebody takes 12 of them, somebody accepts three of them. Uh, and then you have like 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Maccabees. There's some history in there, and then it gets crazier, and then there's some crazy stuff in there. This is where you get the extra angel that, that's in Roman Catholicism, uh, Raphael. He appears in there. Anyway, we won't go into all that. Um, Book of Wisdom and all those sorts of things. The chapter breaks and those kinds of things, those are all done by men. That's, God doesn't put the chapter breaks in there, right? Or numbers on that sort of thing. That's something we've done in verse numbers and all that, so we can... Kind of, because even like in the Septuagint, if you want to go read Psalm 74, you'd have to read it as Psalm 73 <laughs> Septuagint. I think that's right. So there are things like that where there's even the chapter numbering, even though it reads, you know, very similarly. It's it's from the original, it's taken from the same text. Because the Septuagint isn't the, the the problem with the Septuagint. It's not an inspired Greek text. Um, it's it's a translation of the Hebrew into Greek. And that's why when you have the Apocrypha, the Apocrypha is solely in Greek. It's not a translation of anything from Hebrew. So you already have this Greek language being introduced before, before Christ into a, a purely Jewish context. So, which doesn't make... Oh, anyway, we won't, we won't go into that. <laughs> anyway, so I decided, okay, let's, let's look at the Septuagint. This is, again, the Greek translation. And it is of just, of just, the, um, just the Hebrew text, the Old Testament. And it's used three times in the law, the actual, the actual Greek word, synagogue. And it, it refers pretty much to the entirety of all of, of Israel. Now here, it's Exodus 34, 31 and 32. And Moses called them and Aaron and all the rulers of the synagogue toward him. And Moses spoke to them. And afterwards, all the children of Israel came to him and he commanded them all things, whatsoever the Lord had commanded him in the Mount of Sinai. Now, um... This, this idea, this is the, the congregation of all of Israel coming together and the leaders. And that's really, if you look into the English, which I probably, I have the English here for, for what I found in the Psalms, but I didn't do it for the others. But, but I think it's congregation, and the, and the sense there is all the people of Israel. 
right? But again, this is a word that was introduced into the Hebrew in a translation in the intertestamental period. In Numbers 31, and they brought Moses to Eleazar the priest and to all the children of all the children of Israel, the captives and the spoils and the plunders to the camp of Araboth Moab, uh, which is at Jordan by Jericho. And Moses and Eleazar the priest and all the rulers of the synagogue went forth out of the camp to meet him. Now, again, you couldn't read into that a local small gathering, right? This is all the rulers uh, of the congregation of the people of Israel. It, it, it's, that's the picture there. And back in Exodus 34, Aaron and the elders of Israel saw Moses and the appearance of the skin of his face was made glorious and they feared to approach him. Then Moses called them and Aaron and all the rulers of the synagogue turned toward him and Moses spoke to them. And afterwards, all the children of Israel came to him and he commanded them all things whatsoever the Lord had commanded him in the Mount of Sinai. Okay, so that was, um, well, that was, that's the same, that's the same thing. I just moved it back a verse to give a little more context of that, of Moses coming down with the glow on his face and all that. So again, it's not a localized thing like the synagogue at Nazareth. Uh, or in the synagogue here, or Paul went, when Paul went into the Greek Empire, he always went to the synagogue first when he went to, um, I guess, Thessalonica. Uh, and he went to the synagogue, or he went to Berea, and he went to the synagogue first. He always went to the Jew first, because that was his calling in the book of Acts. Covered that before, too. Because uh, the gospel then was to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So anyway, I just wanted to clear that up. Um, the other place it's used as the actual word in English from the Septuagint was in Psalm 73 or 74, depending on which one you're reading. And it's, they said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. They have burned up the synagogues of God. That's plural in the land. Well, it's actually not synagogues in, in the Septuagint there. It's a different word that's actually used there. Now, um, the King James says, they have said in their heart, even all their kindred together, come, let us abolish the feast. No, I'm not sure which translation it is. Well, let us abolish the feast of the Lord. Because when I was looking it up, and again, I'll break this up. I'm, I'm better on my, I'm just free-forming. And I just started this study uh, on my blog. But you could, I looked it up. You can, you can put feasts in there as well as just a general idea. So, you know, they said in their hearts, let us, let's destroy, us, destroy them together. They burned up all the meeting places of God. That's one way it's translated in the New King James is the meeting places, which they use the word synagogues, but that's not, that's not the uh, Greek word that's actually used there. Um, anyway, um, and it's earlier too, thine enemies roar in the midst of thy congregations. That's, that's Psalm 74, 4 in the King James. New King James, our enemies roar in the midst of your meeting places. Again, how they translate that particular thing. Uh, now, that would make more sense for synagogues, meeting places, multiple ones where they do meet. But the word synagogue is not, it's not used. There. And again, it's Hebrew anyway, but if, even if you went by the situation, that's what I do. That's the weird stuff I do. And again, I know that sounds you know, half, half arsed, because it is. Because I haven't, I haven't, I haven't uh, laid it out like I will on the blog when I get some time to go through that a little more coherently. <laughs> so let's segue from that into the Roman Empire and the, the pizza. Uh, very, very briefly here on pizzas, and I'll try to make some spiritual application at the end. <laughs> um, I will, I will actually. The pizza that we know most people are familiar with in the West, or in the United States particularly, is really a New York pizza. Now, it comes out of the New York Italian Little Italy community. My family ran a pizzeria cafe in Queens. Got a picture of my grandmother, maybe I'll put it here and edited it in, of her standing in front of uh, their little cafe, pizzeria, there in Queens. And when she came to live, live with us when she was older, down in Pennsylvania, outside Philadelphia, she, um, sometimes she and my mom would get the fresh dough and they would make pizzas. Now, there's a lot of us in the house, so it's a lot of pizza making, and she was older, so they didn't do it all the time. We would get our pizza from Frank's Pizza, and uh, it was really good. It was really good. New York and Philadelphia are the two places really at the East Coast City. You can, probably, you can get really good pizza in Boston. You can get really good pizza in Baltimore. You can get really good pizza probably in D.C., I would guess. But certainly uh, from the corridor down 95, from Boston through New Jersey, through New York, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, uh, obviously through Philadelphia. You can good, good, good local Italian places um, making pizzas. Now you get this, these bastardized versions in Papa John's and... Domino's, who claim 
that they use fresh ingredients. I cannot see how. The crusts are absolutely... <laughs> I want to be kind to them. It's fast food. Okay. It's like... I happen to like like a like a um, a Burger King burger or even a Hardee's burger, like a charbroiled or, or um, you know grilled burger. But but I would never compare that to like a, a steakhouse burger or you know that sort of thing. And that's the kind of thing. Like if you like fast food pizza, I I can't imagine because you know it's just it's fast food pizza is what it is. It's throwaway. You know I mean in in the burger world, Domino's isn't even like McDonald's. McDonald's makes a, a better quarter pounder in the a burger than Domino's makes a pizza. You know, if I had to pick one in the fast food pizza world, it would be Pizza Hut um, for a couple of reasons. One, I used to love in the 70s and 80s, you could go to Pizza Hut and they had the little arcades there and it was a place to hang out for teens. It was, a, it was a little restaurant and the pizza had a unique taste and the sauce was actually pretty good and there was some flavor to it. Again, I'm not comparing it at all to a really good New York pizza, but for fast food pizza is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about fast food pizza. Uh, Little Caesars isn't bad. I haven't tried their, I mean, they have those crazy crusts, and I, I wanted to try the pretzel one. But again, I try it as fast food. I'm not trying it as a pizza. If I want pizza, like Friday night, we get pizza. Tonight, we went to Mario's. Mario's makes a good pizza. You know, I think Tony's is the other one. In Charlotte, they call it Tony's down there, that part of the state. But in this part of the state, um, you know, it's Mario's. And also in, in Greensboro, we have uh, a few restaurants called Elizabeth's. And Elizabeth's makes a really good pizza, too. Now, those are New York-style pizzas. We have a place called Cucino Forno here in Greensboro. i got to get back there. It's just on the other side of the city, and we don't go over there too much. But Cucino Forno has the big, you know, wood ovens, you know, the kind you see in Italy. And they make really an Italian pizza. Because I remember when I went to Italy, uh, my family is primarily from Naples slash Projida. Uh, and the other side, my mother was born in Bari. On the other side, on the Adriatic side basically straight across the, uh, the boot there and then down down the hill some family down there in Lecce and Taranto and those places like that so it's southern Italy and but but Naples is really kind of where uh, you equate with pizza even even New York pizza came out of, of sort of that culture what we know as New York pizza with the heavy cheeses but you can sort of see that too in Naples when I got when we got off the train from Paris 1987 in, in Venice, we were hungry, and so, yeah, so I'm, I'm in Italy now, I'm gonna get my pizza. Well, I got this pizza, and it was, the dough was there and everything, and it was, but it looked kind of watery. I got a prosciutto pizza, it had prosciutto on it, and you know, and a mix of things, and it was kind of watery on it. I'm like, this is really interesting. It was phenomenal, it was phenomenal. And again, I was sort of protesting in my heart because I was in Northern Italy, and you gotta remember, we're Italians, there's Northern Italy, Northern Italians, Southern Italians, and Sicilians. Well, we were Southern Italians, so. <laughs> but anyway, it was it was phenomenal. And then when we went to Rome, uh, was it Rome? I can't remember where, where our relatives. We had relatives in, in in body in that area in Taranto and Lecce, like I said. And we had relatives in Rome <clears throat> that we visited with. And they took us to a little small restaurant where they had pizza and pizzeria, and it was it was phenomenal too. But it was more New York style kind of thing. But again, there's a crossover there. There's a crossover there with Italy. Um, but anyway, you know, so that's, that's the, that's the sort of thing. And <laughs> make a spiritual application out of my pizzas. Uh, you know, if you really want to, if, if you really want to understand your Bible, now I, I want to pause here and say two things at the end here. One is, I think the analogy is going to be obvious. You can get the cheap knockoff pretending to be as good as the real thing, Christianity. Or you can take the time to do it right. Take the time to get the highest quality of everything. <laughs> it's a really bad analogy, I know. But you know where I'm going with that. <clears throat> but at the base of it all, no matter what it is, <clears throat> and I hope this comes through when I talk, because I, you know, I get, I'm, I'm very opinionated on things, obviously. I, you know what I feel about the dispensations, what I feel about the book of Matthew, and all these things. Because I'm reasoning from the scriptures that it makes sense. It makes sense when I reason from the scriptures. Uh... Again, you can't get the gospel of the kingdom. We talked about that. You can't cram in there what we believe today as the gospel of the kingdom. It just doesn't fit. It doesn't make any sense. And the Lord's words in Matthew are very openly clear. We talked about those, so I won't, I won't go over those again. Uh, but <clears throat> at the bottom of it all, at the base of it all, wherever you are, if you're in Christ, meaning you have no hope in yourself, you realized that 
you are a child of Adam, and in Adam all have the curse of death, obviously, on us. You know, we talked about before, we, we can't, we talked about this before, can't imagine a world without me. But everybody's ever thought that in the history of the world. And this is as late as it's ever been. Today is the latest it's ever been in the history of the world. And uh, all, those, all those people are dead. And I can't imagine a world without me. But there's going to be a world without me someday, unless the Lord intervene. Please, Lord. <laughs> right? Uh, so anyway, but we're all going to die, right? And that's the problem. The problem is death. And it's not God going to torture you. We've gone over that a million times. You can go listen to the ones on hell. God's not sitting there salivating, getting his hands on you so he can torture you uh, because of your sin of Adam. <laughs> you know? But you're going to die in decay, and I'm going to die in decay. And the Lord had to do undo that. And he did uh, He undid that in the grave, and he undid that in, on the cross. I mean, in the resurrection. So, and he's, he's offered us that free life. He took the penalty himself. And only he could pay it. You can die, in, but it still doesn't pay. I mean, you can't pay a, 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 a debt that large yourself. It's impossible. It's, a, it's an eternal debt, using that word as we understand it. And you can't pay an eternal debt. But Christ could. And he willingly did. And that, that's the basis for everything. Right? If you're there, right? if that's where you are, and you said, I, you know, I, I'm trusting in nothing in myself. Not Jesus plus. Not Jesus plus Mary. Not Jesus plus I did these good things. Not, yeah, Jesus is okay, but Buddha is great too. Or... Somehow Jesus is going to, you know, no, we have the we have the ministry of reconciliation, Paul says. That means we go out and we don't preach hell and tell people they're going to be damned and God's going to hate them and burn them in hell. Uh, we tell them God has already been reconciled to them. It says in 2 Corinthians, uh, God was in Christ reconciling himself to the world. He's reconciled to us. That's incredible. He has reconciled us. So if that's where you are, if you're reconciled to Christ, God through Christ, alone, because he, his work was perfect and he did everything, and you're placing your hope and trust in that, in that, and you experience that life in yourself, that new nature, that's a free gift. If that's where you, if that's where you are, okay, that's where we can start our fellowship. Might not get any further than that, but we can start there. We can find our joy there. We can sing, we can sing hymns together. We can sing worship songs together because we're, because that's where we're resting, right? I'm not going to draw a line and say, if you don't understand the dispensations the way I do, you know, then, you, you know, you're the devil's advocate or whatever, or you're a tool of the devil. Or if, if you're somehow hoping, if you think you're under the new covenant, which certainly I don't believe that. Um, again, at the end of the day, what I would say to you is, and to me, is, well, I'm not your judge. But we're all going to stand before the Lord, and he's going he's gonna to judge us how we handled the Word of God. Now, he, he can't touch our life. Life, we talked about that before. Life can't be touched. Like with Job, the devil could touch everything but his life. Because that's, it says uh, that our life is hid in Christ, in God. That's where our life is hid. It's already hidden there. That's our resurrection life. Not my life now. My resurrection life is already hid and it's protected. No one can get to it. No evil can get to it. I can't get to it. I can't ruin it. Right? Uh, but how I handle the truth, that will be judged. And there are things like rewards and crowns and pri the prize of Philippians 3. Those things can be won or lost. And for some people, it's their place in the kingdom. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about being resurrected according to our rank in a certain order. Christ the first fruits, and then after him, those according to their rank in 1 Corinthians 15, their order. Right? So there's going to be order. There's, there's people who are going to earn special resurrection. There's a special resurrection. Did you know that? There's a special resurrection that's spoken of, and we'll finish with this, in Philippians. And it's, you can't see it in your English a lot of times, but it is in the Greek. And now, the, the apostles all knew about resurrection. They all believed in resurrection. They all hoped in resurrection. Abraham going back. Uh, even, you know, Adam. You know, there's the hope of resurrection. Uh, the Pharisees certainly did uh, in Judaism. It, it, it wasn't a foreign thought to them. So when the Lord said he was going to raise from the dead, and they looked at each other and goes, what does he mean, raise from the dead? You know, they weren't ignorant of the concept of resurrection. They were very well familiar with it. What they were ignorant of was the, the, the word the Lord used there, the emphasizer was, he talked about being resurrected out from among the rest of the dead. And that they didn't understand. Ek. Out from. The out the Ek Anastasius. The out from the rest. Now that's not used anywhere else except for one other place. Where, where in Philippians, Paul talks about the prize. He says, I haven't achieved it yet. And he says he's looking forward to obtaining the out-resurrection from the rest of the dead. And it's something to be obtained. 
Now, again, Paul, you say, well, Paul did. I certainly can't. None of us is Paul. None of us is as faithful as Paul. None of us is as learned as Paul. None of us is as studied in the scriptures as Paul. But that's the whole thing. God's not holding me to Paul's standard. God's not holding me to your standard. God is not holding you to my standard. I have a standard. God knows what he's revealed to me. He knows in my life and he knows my decisions and he knows my situation. That's why I wouldn't judge somebody in another situation that I'm not in or haven't been in or never will be in. You know, let's say a, a father who, who steals bread for his starving children in flower stand. <laughs> Making up a place. I don't want to get anybody upset. All right. I don't know. I've never been there. I've never been there where my children were so, were looking at me and going, Father, you know, Father. And, and uh, they don't have any food. And a, and a bread truck comes by and leaves the door open and I steal a couple of loaves and one the bread for the kids. Today is for the kids. Right? I don't know. And I'm not going to judge that man. And again, he might do it against his own conviction, but he does it because he loves his children. I don't know. So there's all kinds of things. And that's, that's an obvious, simple example about basic sin. But even when it comes to theology, I don't know what you're called to do. Now, if, if, I, if I persist in error... Uh, that's a whole other thing. I think any of us can persist in error. And I think if we, are to, we are commanded to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman who needeth not ashamed, be ashamed, rightly dividing word of truth, and to handle the word of truth carefully, right? And to cut our lines very carefully. So wherever you are, you know, and also God knows my intellect. I know what my IQ is when I was tested when I was young, and my brother has a much higher IQ than I have. So my God's not going to hold me in stand. I hope it's my brother who has a much higher IQ than I do. You know, and then of course, obviously, somebody let's say Down syndrome person who loves the Lord Jesus, right? God's not going to hold that person to the same standard He would hold me. Who have and again today we have access to the Greek, we have access to the Hebrew, we have access to these dictionaries, we have access to all of this information. You have access to hearing me say this. You have access to a billion other people on the internet. Now, it also makes it harder because now we have to do a little more sifting, right? But back in the day, some people didn't even have access to the scripture. Certainly not in the vernacular. Certainly not in their language. So, you know, it's, I can't judge those people by the same standard. You know? But we have all these tools. We have the word of God. And there are a lot of believers today who have the word of God and never crack it open. I mean, I don't crack it open enough. I don't read it enough, you know. I mean, some of the minor prophets I probably haven't read in a couple of years or so, and I really need to go read them. I mean, even if I don't understand it, even if I go read Nahum and I don't understand it all, or Joel or something, and I don't understand every verse in there, I need to read it. Because, you know, you go through to it. Sometimes you read something 10, 15 times, and like the 16th time you read it, oh, now you see something, right? Now something makes sense. Now it, it clicks in your mind. Oh, yeah, Paul said this, or the Lord said that, and that sounds like he was something the same. I mean, I can't believe I went so long in my Christian life without ever really reading Isaiah 66 about the, the world to come. You know, in 66, go read Isaiah 66, 24. It'll change your life. It should, anyway, if, you're, if you believe in the health theology. You know, and carcasses and dead bodies and all those things. We talked about that a lot on here, so I'm, I'm not saying, some of you might already know all that. Um, but it was a long time. I, I never really looked at it because I just adopted the doctrine of hell as I was taught. And, you know, Paul says when I was a child, I... I talked like a child, and I did childish things, but now I'm an adult, I put away childish things. I think the doctrine of hell is a childish thing. You ask any five, six-year-old uh, kid in Sunday school, they can, they can tell you about Jesus is in heaven. When you die, you go to heaven. And uh, people who don't love Jesus, they go to hell, and Satan burns them. It's a childish belief. Both of those are childish beliefs. God's con God has a plan for the earth. Uh, most, of his, most of the Bible is about his plan for the earth. Talk about that a lot. And, you know, he's not torturing people. In hell either. And, and Satan's not down there in a Carmen video shaking his fist at me going, Michael Scott, oh, your blog, your podcast is really ruining my plans. Ah! <laughs> and little demon's going, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Oh, Michael's podcast is going out. We can't, we can't beat him and Carmen at the same time. You know, they're both Italian. You know, <laughs> but Carmen's late Carmen. I forgive me, Carmen. Uh, he's dead anyway. He can't hear me. I'll see him in the resurrection and he can correct me. Um, anyway, that's because you know, we had half an hour. And so that's it. So I wanted to get all those things out, talk a little about pizza, talk about the benches at the university, <laughs> talk about the Septuagint, talk about the synagogues, and talk about the out-resurrection. So there you go. 
and maybe we'll explore some of those in more depth another time but all this can be found on the blog again www.contextorconfusion.com you have to have the www in there i'll put it on the screen but if you listen to the audio version you can go there and also next time i'm going to plug my book i'm my, my allegory my allegorical book i put a lot of effort in that thing and, and I, I really um it's probably the thing i'm most proud of that i've done personally Besides my phenomenal music career, I mean, my music career, man, you've seen the videos, man, you've heard the stuff on Spotify. Anyway, bye-bye. Just, just get out of here, Michael, go. Just go. All right, bye. Do you guys remember that commercial? Oh, yeah, We're back with a nostalgic commercial from Domino's Pizza that apparently you either love or you hate. Anybody a fan? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know who's not a fan, though? Who? Mm -hmm. The birthplace of pizza. Yeah, what's going on there? So they officially hate it in Italy. How do we know this? Domino's has reportedly closed its last branch in the country after facing slow sales <laughs> in Italy. Surprise. What a shock.